my point is, is that everybody sitting in this room is not trained and skilled in the same set of objectives. Why is it that when we give our awards out, it's based on this one criteria? Now we now have a teaching award and a research award, but we still raise our students in grad school as though there's this one right thing. That one right thing is to do high quality research. I think it, it harms us to not recognize that social psychologists should go into marketing. Let's send all of our students out of the field so I can get paid more. Because there's too many of us looking for too few jobs. And, you know, down the hill in the business school, they get double what I get in their first year because there's not enough business faculty. Well, psych faculty, we could fix that problem. Hello, and welcome to Psych Sessions, episode number 145. Eric here. By special arrangement with the Western Psychological Association held in April 2022 in Portland, Oregon, Psych Sessions recorded select conference sessions and recorded interviews. What a special treat to hear the WPA 2022 Presidential Address delivered by Dr. John Gray of Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. John was introduced by longtime WPA leader Heidi Riggio from California State University, Los Angeles. The title of his talk, Now, The Time to Transform Psychology into a Diverse, Socially Just, and Sustainable Discipline. Thank you again to WPA for providing the opportunity to record these important conference moments. The Psych Sessions podcast is sponsored by STP. That's the Society for the Teaching of Psychology. That's APA's second division. Become a member of STP for only $25. Just head to teachpsych.org. There is so much you get for your membership. We would like to remind listeners that the views or product endorsements expressed on Psych Sessions do not represent the views, supports, or endorsements of STP. The Psych Sessions podcast is sponsored by Macmillan Learning. Macmillan Learning's Achieve for Psychology sets a whole new standard for integrating assessments, activities, and analytics into your teaching. One way Achieve does this is through new goal setting and reflection surveys. Pre-built and easy to assign, these surveys help students to find and attain their own personal goals for the class while giving instructors insights into each student's academic skills and emotional well-being. The goal setting and reflection surveys are just one tool in Achieve's suite of reports and insights and another example of how Achieve goes well beyond just delivering first-rate class-to-class course materials. For a preview of Achieve for Psychology, please go to macmillanlearning.com forward slash psych sessions. I want to thank the Western Psychological Association Board of Directors so much. And I'm just honored to be of service to this fantastic organization, um, especially because it's so student-centered and so promotive of the success of, of young faculty. And it's my pleasure and honor this evening to introduce our WPA president, Dr. John Gray. Dr. John Gray is professor of psychology at Pacific Lutheran University. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology from Shippensburg University in Pennsylvania, his Master of Arts in social psychology at the University of Toledo, and his PhD in experimental social psychology at University of Toledo. Dr. Gray's research focuses on interpersonal perception, crowdsourcing science, engaging students in undergraduate research, and capstone pedagogy. He has published two books, Designing and Teaching Undergraduate Capstone Courses, and A Journey into Open Science and Research Transparency in Psychology in 2021, published by Rutledge. Dr. Gray is the recipient of the K.T. Tang Faculty Excellence in Research Award from Pacific Lutheran University. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our current WPA president, Dr. John Gray. (laughs) 
and a very dear friend as well. Right. I don't know what happened to my uh, screen. It's on, but it seems to be connected to the wrong computer. It still seems connected to the wrong computer, which I don't understand. I was there a second ago. Can we blame it all on Heidi? Please. So uh, while we're getting the technical issues worked out, I'm going to, I'm going to no, confess that, all. that uh, I'm really a salesman, uh, more than a theorist. Uh, I certainly developed, uh, I focused on methodology throughout my career. Uh, so I'm not going to bring you a lot of theory. Uh, I'm going to try to make a sale. I believe that the argument that I'm going to make here is the justification for the special programming that we have enjoyed here. The title of the talk is now the time to transfer psychology into a diverse, socially just and sustainable discipline. Uh, you'll notice that the conference was themed, advancing diversity, social justice, and, and sustainability. Uh, this, that was my idea. I'll take credit for that. But it was Chris Aberson and Amber Gaffney. Amber, are you here? I know Chris is. Hey, Chris, could you stand up? Here's our, here's our program chair. You know, the invited speaker program seemed like Chris said, what does John need to see? I'm just going to get him 25 speakers that he's desperately wanting to see. And I, I just... If I didn't get to your invited lectures because I had something else that I had to do because I really wanted to see all of these. Uh, before we get too far along in here, I want to introduce uh, my favorite blue heron that hangs out on our beaver wetlands. He's, he or she is standing on top of a, a beaver dam eating a piece of salmon that we were told they weren't on our property. So uh, to me, this is a picture representing sustainability at old wetlands that's uh, draining about 20 square miles of of Western Washington water. That's what you're going to see in the background as we move forward. And here is the overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I will, I will acknowledge that there's a lot of uh, bullet points here. It should be five or six and there's eight, but I'm hoping that some of these turn through a little bit quicker uh, and that we get out of here in, in 50 minutes and Chris can buy me a bunch of drinks. In the morning when you rise, do you open up your eyes? See what I see. Can you see the same thing every day? Now, I practiced a lot more of that than I was going to acapella. Uh, does anyone know that song? Anybody, any one person know that song? One per my wife. Okay. So uh, I'll tell you uh, who the artist is on that song in a minute. But I really frame that talk. I really frame this talk around uh, this song. And, and so it goes on to say, uh, do when you're in the morning, do you look around and if, what do I need to do to fix the world? Do you look around and then what am I going to do to get my perspective back? Do you know there's a time and do you know, there's a word that's the, 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 the song. Do you know there's a time? What time is it now? And what's the word love? And then he goes on to say, or the band goes on to say, it's right for me. It's not that you need to do it necessarily. This is what I need to do. Now, I don't know if it's because this song came out the year I was born. I don't know if Yes is just my favorite band and I can't get past that. But there's something about this song and this message that really works for me. So, we want change. What progress do we want from that change? If you attended the conference, you saw a lot of talks calling for change. I would argue that we all disagree often because we have conflicting notions about what, what utopia should be. The perfect future utopia. What is yours? I would argue that your vision of the future utopia is going to shape lots of other decisions about things you're going to do now. 
And I'd like to make an argument here that the DJS lens that I was trying to bring to this conference is a way to move forward through this progress. So for instance, if I have a goal when I'm conducting my research, I might end up engaging in experimenter bias, unintentionally creating the outcomes of the experiment following what I want. So my individual bias impacts the conclusions that I'm going to draw. Why does this matter with utopia? Well, what utopia is your utopia? So in, I do this in class, by the way, but so I could ex imagine two extremes in utopia. One is a pastoral utopia, back to nature. It's all green. Human impact is zero or minimal. And uh, when I was Googling this, most everything you're going to see is that I was Googling this. Uh, apparently that Thomas Cole did a lot of argue, uh, he, he, this is by Thomas Cole in 1834, the pastoral state, a future, a perfect future back to nature. Well, the other side of that does not require us to value nature itself. Maybe we are only concerned about feeding the humans so we can get off the planet, right? If our only goal is to get off the planet, the planet itself might not matter. And so I Googled enlightenment utopia, expecting to find nothing, honestly. And apparently there's a video game with the city of Piltover, a shining metropolis of progress, prosperity. Where are the trees, right? There are none. And, you know, you go to New York City, you go to, to LA, you just, you see buildings, you see infrastructure, you see humanity. We see some trees, but if you've been in any of the old growth forests in Portland, in California, Washington, or, or Idaho, or Oregon, it's not the pastoral utopia. It's not. So welcome to the Anthropocene geological age. How many of you knew we'd entered the Anthropocene? How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? Love it. I'm so glad. That, that you came today. So welcome to the Anthropocene age. Uh, the rainforest drying out. Glaciers falling off Antarctica. The plastic circle, the plastic dumps in the, in the ocean. By the way, I have plans to turn that into a new continent. Anybody want to talk to me about? Yeah, I do actually. I, uh, and then these giants. So uh, this company, Kit Mondo, sells the biggest, largest, heaviest equipment if you want to move Earth. Welcome to the Anthropocene age. Wikipedia dis defines it as the geological epoch dating from the commencement of when humans impacted the Earth more than the Earth was impacting itself and estimates the beginning of it at approximately the fifties. Now there's arguments as to whether or not it started in the early 1900s or the early two two thousands, but somewhere along the line, we went from a point where the earth will do whatever it feels like to recover itself, to repair itself after humans have taken all the stuff off of it to the point where we are doing more impact on the earth than the earth can do to recover. That is the Anthropocene geological age. So let's review the rainforest, the glaciers, the plastic in the ocean, the giant machines. Now, my guess is that you all have other ideas of the many other things that represent this now, you know, giant mines, uh, nuclear, nuclear weapons. Like we are powerful creatures that are now shaping the planet in the way we want it to be. So what does that mean for our future? What does it mean that we've entered a new age, an epic? Well, I, we're going to come back to that in a bit, but we've got to imagine a multiverse of futures that, that right now. So ever since I predicted that email was never going to be a thing in 1992, True story. This email thing, it'll blow over. Nobody's going to do this. Uh, I've, I've tried to stop predicting the future like I know it because 
I mean, how wrong can you possibly be? Yeah. Um, so I, I'd like to introduce you to three characters that I actually introduced in my class right now in the semester. Hope, demise, and anticipation. So I often teach stats and research methods. We're at that point in the term where students are wondering, should I withdraw from this class? Am I going to get a, a C, a B, an A? What should I do? And I say, look, we, you know, we learned that regression line thing. Let's use that to our advantage and predict your future. So let's take your current grade, whatever that is, and let's take hope, hope's perspective. Hope's going to get a 92 for the rest of the term. What's your grade going to be then? No one gets higher than a 92 on any of my exams. So that, I, 92, how are you going to do? Or demise. And demise is you get a 60% for the rest of the term. If you show up in my class and take the exam, chances are you're going to get at least a 60%. Where are you? Hope or demise? Well, what if we just anticipate your past? I have a midterm exam. I have grades on your writing. I have lab reports. Now we have those categories. Insert your past exam scores for your current future ones and see where your grade's going to be. Hope, demise, and anticipation. And I hand them these three scores. Like you're bounded around an A and a B plus. And they go, oh, thank goodness I'm not going to study anymore. Or you're bounded between a B and a D plus. Oh, uh, I'm going to work really hard. Is there anything I can get a, an A for? No, you can't get an A. So if we take this for our future and the Anthropocene age, hope to me, the time is now. And the word is love. Demise, the time is never. And the word's not love. Now, I had a word up here, and I looked at that word, and I thought, well, that's maybe not the opposite of love. Well, I don't know what the word isn't, but it's not love, right? Uh, time is never. We're never going to change. And the word is not love. Or maybe it's anticipation. The past is the future, and words won't change human behavior. We'll come back to what that might look like uh, near the end. But for now... Even if we have hope, demise, and anticipation, we have to put this within the constraints of the pastoral or enlightened vision. How many of you want to get to Mars? Like Mars and Saturn, that's where humans should be. We got to move off this planet. Who's on, who's on board with space travel? I love space travel, right? Who thinks space travel is the end of humanity? Let's stay right where we are. Do you see pastoral versus enlightened hope? You both hope a future but they are di diametrically opposed. Hope versus, or pastoral versus enlightened demise. That our demise ends up being uh, that we go back, all the humans are wiped out, the planet starts recovering. We're enlightened demise. Putin presses the button, and then we hit World War III, and then the planet can't recover because we've poisoned it. Or pastoral versus enlightened anticipation. Of course, we all know better. It's not a two-way street. It's not pastoral versus enlightened. There's a whole continuum in there, right? Who wants to both love the earth and go to space, right? So it doesn't have to be one or the other, but there's something going on. We don't all agree. All right, I want to take a little pause and remind us that the time scale of human evolution, as we're looking at change, how long does change take? Uh, you know, we're going back to the beginning of animals here, about 24 million years, billion. More numbers than I can count. Uh, I'm not a fundamentalist, so I don't think it's 10,000. On the right side, we have the, the, the family tree that brings us to humans. Now, you and I are about 100,000 years old-ish, right? We've essentially looked like this for 100,000 years-ish. Look at all of the, none of the rest of them were, well, Neanderthals were hanging out a little bit in that space, but the rest of them are gone. And look at how far deep that history goes. And now we're talking about 6 million years. So we've been working toward humanity for 6 billion years. We've been humans for about 100,000. And, you know, we've, in the last 150, entered a new epic because we've developed so much that we can impact the planet more than it can recover. No, I, by the way, I'm not saying that we're horrible yet, right? I'm not criticizing us for being in an anthro uh, post age. I'm just noting where we are. 
So I now want to put this, uh, you know, now we're humans, right? So if we go from 6.2 million, 100,000 years ago, what did we achieve in that 4 million years? We got fire. That's pretty impressive. It seems not such a big deal now, but it's pretty impressive. Tools, funerals, right? One of the things that makes us human is that we think about day, art and language, war, domestication, if things get, as we get closer to, I had to, no, so I'm 51. Am I 51, Lisa? I'm 51. <laughs> so I'm a half century ish. So if we just look at my lifetime, things that came, and I'm assuming that, but how many of you are less than 30? So you don't have to raise your hand. Okay, you did. Uh, I remember our first microwave. I remember our house's first one. I remember getting a color TV. I remember getting more than three channels, right? That the, the things have changed remarkably in my lifetime. Uh, the internet, I, have the, I still have it, the World Wide Web 1.0 software back bundle. I bought that in 1994. In the last five to 25 years, things have even accelerated more. Uh, cell phones have just changed remarkably where we are, all right? Well, let's put it all similarly. Let's look at the social side of that similar change. Now, I've put these now in the, the mental constructs that I have, which is recently, for me, five to 25 years is recently. For some of you, that's your whole life. But for me, that's recent. Uh, my lifetime, the last century, the last millennia, all of civilization, and all of human existence. We've done a lot. We've come a long way. I don't think that we necessarily should feel bad that we've progressed or developed as far as we have. But we've entered this new space where the pandemic, fake news, and what, what's up with this war? Like, why do we have this war going on right now? This is all very recent. And I feel like it's brought us to a point where we want to change more than we did five 10, 15, 20 years ago. In my life, I've never seen, in the summer of 2020, I've never seen the population as motivated to engage in change. Now, I wasn't alive in the 60s. And I think that was the last time that we saw that level of uh, effort to make movement and change. Why is it the time now? I'm not I'm going to try to get through this slide without using the word that none of us want to hear anymore. But New York Times noted that this word was notable. And it got to the point, it was so notable that we no longer wanted to hear it. It feels like the word no longer has meaning. But think about how we got to that point, that we had a, years of... It can't get any different than this. This is the weirdest it's been in America in at least 50 years. Nope. Okay, well, this is the weirdest thing that's happened in the last 50. No, no, no. Get ready. More's coming. So if we are at this period now and it's time for change, what does the world need from us? We need to do our science. And I tried to get the four, is Cosby here? The four types of uh, science in his methods book, which I love Cosby and, and Bates, the methods book. But we need to describe, record and describe what's going on. You know, I, I complain to my students all the time that psychology forgot that biology just goes out and counts frogs. And that's good science for biology because we got to know how many frogs there are. I think we need to count people. How many people aren't wearing masks when they're supposed to? How many people engage in certain behaviors? What are things that lead to uh, people doing this, that, or the other? We need to predict outcomes, whether or not we know causal inference. So we spend a lot of time wanting to be theoretical. We spend a lot of time trying to get to the answer of why. And yet, sometimes our science isn't ready for why. Let's just explain what is and what we're going to predict given what we know. And then maybe why will come along. Professionally, we need to create more mechanisms to improve quality of life. We need to offer care through mental health, and we need to share through teaching and, and in, in communities. So what do we need as a field? What does psychology need? I 
I Googled theory unification to see where we were on that. And I was so shocked, I Googled it three times. I Googled it without any time constraint on it. If no time constraint on it, we get uh, Henrix. Do I have to buy my beer? I get Henrix, 2011, a unified theory of psychology. If I Google the last 25 years, the last two decades, I get anxiety and cognition, a unified theory. And if I Google just 2022, I get 5,800 results. And when I looked at this, I thought, we're not getting unified. We're just using the word unified theory as low lo, like it was that other word that I'm not going to mention throughout the entire talk. So rather than new theory, I would ask that as a field, we start thinking better about role stratification. Who are my teachers? I teach. I don't do research because I teach. Who are you? Let's respect you. Who are my researchers? I do research. Who's at a school that values research and you have grad students, but we also need you to teach? Who's at my type of school? We want you to teach that if you do research with undergrads, you're awesome, right? We, yes! My point is, is that everybody sitting in this room is not trained and skilled in the same set of objectives. Why is it that when we give our awards out, it's based on this one criteria. Now we now have a teaching award and a research award, but we still raise our students in grad stu school as though there's this one right thing. That one right thing is to do high quality research. I think it, it harms us to not recognize that social psychologists should go into marketing. They, let's send all of our students out of the field so I can get paid more because there's too many of us looking for too few of jobs. And, you know, down the hill in the business school, they get double what I get in their first year because there's not enough business faculty. Well, psych faculty, we can fix that problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, all right. All right, so the second, the second slide, uh, I, I'm a little more confident on. Do you remember this paper? Baumeister, Vos, and Funder. Now, it's a little ironic that Baumeister's on the, uh, on the lead here, but essentially the paper was, the, there's too many times that we're just learning what psychology means by pushing a button. Like, how often are we spending our world pushing a button? The, the last, now, of course, we spend a lot of time pushing our button this way, right? But, you know, when we're measuring prejudice and stereotype, group work, pro-social behavior, and when I, when you bring me a vignette, I was a managing executive editor of journal social psychology for nine years. You bring me a vignette. I don't believe you. It might be worth publishing. You might've done the science, right? But me, I'm looking at that going, uh, it, they think they're going to do that. But is that what happens? We need better data outside figure push. And then I love these scientific utopia papers. So there's scientific utopia paper one, two, and three. This isn't really the talk where I go into what is in these papers, but essentially uh, scientific utopia one was improved communications, uh, uh, published peer reviews, digitized science. The, uh, the second one was about rewards, uh, disentangle uh, promotion from publication, uh, make it easier to do crowdsourcing research. And the third one was all about crowdsourcing research and everything we've done with it. And so if you want to see, well, if you want to see what John Gray thinks we need to do for the future, I, I, I bank a lot on the scientific utopic papers. Uh, I almost left the slide completely blank. Who, who are the mental health professionals here? Yeah, I almost left this completely blank because I, I prefer to hurt people than help them. I, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time working in the therapy. That was a joke, but I don't. I don't spend a lot of time in therapy spaces. I have no idea. So then I thought, well, if I have a completely blank slide, who knows? And so the digital transformation, we've seen this in the last couple of years that because we've had to be home, that acceleration of interacting between the patient or the client and, and the counselor online. And then person-centered, empirically driven care, that seemed like a safe thing to put up there and that you wouldn't all 
throw tomatoes at me, call me Macron. And beyond that, I got to be honest with you, this is not my area. I just, I'd like to not reach beyond what I can know. And I'm sure you've got things that we need to do. And then finally, it's time for us to confront personal professional biases. Uh, these are only two examples of things that are going on, but uh, APA did publish the apology to people of color for their role in, in perpetuating race and so on. Uh, APA journals recently sent this uh, guide to editors so for the publishing process to become more equitable, diverse, and inclusive. Uh, if you haven't seen this, uh, it's an intriguing document. And, and if you're in edit, if you are in the editorial space, I think it's worth, uh, reading through this. And, you know, I don't agree with all these, by the way, I loved all of your talks and I disagreed with every one of them. And I, I texted my dad, who's even more argumentative than I am. And I'm like, I am practicing not speaking for two days. And he's like, well, why don't you question them? I'm like, not now. I will argue with myself, dad. But I don't agree with everything that's in these two documents. But if you just ignore it, we're not moving forward, right? Uh, updated curriculum. So uh, I don't know how many people got to, to see the uh, symposium we had a couple hours ago uh, with uh, Rihanna Mason and her crew. Uh, we've got two edited volumes that we're working on. One should be out a year from now. Uh, the other one, uh, we just got the book contract a couple of weeks ago. And, and so we go and find dissertations written by women of color from before 1980. And then we summarize the dissertation. We talk about the woman. We do a reproducibility critique because I'm open science, open science all the time. It's always got to come back to that for me. Uh, an alternative perspective so that we can introduce it, alternative perspectives while having a secondary interpretation of their work. And then how would you use it in the classroom? So one goal here is to diversify the curriculum because the textbooks haven't done it yet. The textbooks are slow. And so we need to diversify the curriculum somehow. Uh, we believe 20 chapters, you can find something in every course to at least add and diversify the curriculum. The other thing I'll do is uh, point out uh, Rihanna Sherry Basin. Are you here? She's got to be here somewhere. Yeah, so her and Curtis Floyd uh, just published this book about a year ago, Academic Pipeline Program. So it, it's a book that that looks through across the country all the academic programs that are trying to help disadvantaged individuals get through the system to become PhDs. So it's, it's a very cheap book and very informative. <laughs> and on the right, I wasn't going to put this on here because I, I'm the chair of the co-chair of the fundraising committee, but Eric Landrum said, John, you got to put that up there. Uh, so I convinced Sai Kai to uh, start a new scholarship. If I raise $50,000, they'll double it and they'll be in a endowed scholarship every year uh, to go to a woman of color to go to grad school. Yeah, go ahead, clap for that. So right now it's at 42,340. Uh, the, 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 the chairs of the committee are gonna donate about 3,000 in, in a month or so because we've made our match campaign, which means we've got less than 5,000 to go. Please donate, please donate, um, and, and help, help, help others. Okay. So what do we get? I've just said psychology needs to help the world and we need in psychology. So what do we have to achieve this? Well, remember that slide a few slides ago, all those technological transfer transformations aid us. And I'm going to argue that the open science movement has done a lot for, for psychology. So first, technological transformations. Uh, who else used SurveyMonkey? I remember I was at a, a CSU Fullerton week-long summer learn how to do digital experimentation in 2002. And the founder of SurveyMonkey was there telling us about SurveyMonkey. I'm like, wow, this is weird. I can collect data online? <laughs> Like, think of it, think of the children, think of this. Think of you, if you had to collect your data for your senior research project with pencil and paper, where you sat in a lab for four hours a day 
for four weeks and still didn't have enough data. That's the way it used to be. But of course, that's not where it ended. And, you know, we've got all sorts of improvements on measurement, storage, Dataverse it, uh, was the first to come out. If you know me, you know I'm selling the open science framework. It's free and easy to use, and it's built to advance open science. But these are all tools that have come along that, you know, when we had that replication crisis, some of that was about it was time to shift to the new century. I, I remember, and many of you do too, submitting a manuscript with three hard copies in a big envelope. And that those three hard copies got mailed to the reviewers who then wrote on it, printed a paper and mailed it back and then mailed you. I mean, it was a lot of mailing. It took a long time. Will you share your data? Heck no. Why? How could I? How am I getting it to you? But we've made it easy now. It's now easy to share data and materials. And you know what? It's been remarkably fast. When we, when I went to the board of uh, the, the journal of social psychology and said, we need to require materials. And they know what's going to do that. John, you're going to, the, the journal will suffer. And I said, yeah, but maybe not. Maybe it'll be better. And you know what? We didn't have any problem. There was not one problem. What was funny was everybody thought I was requiring data and they're sharing the data. I'm like, I'm glad you're sharing the data. That's good. We'll give you an open data badge, but we need your materials. Oh, sure. Here's your materials. So in 2021, we then started requiring data. And so for one year, now I'm no longer at journal social psychology, but for one year, we were training new authors to submit their data. You know how, how many times we lost somebody because it was less than 5% that said either, no, I can't share my data or no way, right? Those are the two, they're two different responses. And you have to read that response in an email, right? They, they don't say this in an email, but you can see it. <laughs> okay. So then we also have these digital tools uh, that, that have occurred in reporting. And this is a little bit of a chronological order, but not fully. And it's certainly not a complete list. This is the list bounded by John Gray's bias. Okay. And I acknowledge that. But, uh, you know, there's the Psych Archives preprint service where you don't need, a, you don't just upload your stuff. Students finish their senior capstone. Upload the senior capstone project. Uh, JASP changed the, the narrative in 20, uh, was it 2013? Uh, there was the editorials and no more P values will be published in the Journal of, of Applied Social Psychology. No P values? How are we going to do science without any P values? They survived. They're still there. We moved on. JSP, where I was Journal of Social Psychology, and we were the third journal to adopt open science badges. We were the first journal to require materials. We were the first journal to require data. Um, and, and I left it, the impact factor, not the only way to measure the quality, but I started, the impact factor was below 0.4. I left the impact factor was 2.7, 1.7. Sorry, I didn't mean to inflate that artificial. But the four times improvement. It, what we did scared away a couple people, but what it did was it brought everybody to the table. Uh, Pre-registered report, so... Uh, Contemporary research in social psychology, you submit a pre-registered report, stage one. They say, okay, if you do exactly what you said there, we'll publish it. Go collect your data. Um, so I love Chris. Uh, Calabra is uh, open science from the Society for Improving op uh, Psychological Science. Their journal, Calabra, they also have pre-registered reports. It's, there's not a lot of journals that, that take pre-registered reports at the moment. AMPPS is an American uh, Association for Psychological Sciences journal that came about. I say, you see what I say. There were too many meta science papers. They couldn't put them all in perspectives in psych science. Like, okay, let's just make a new journal because we can't handle them all elsewhere. I want to note they also charge $1,250 to publish there. And I'm going to bring that up here in another minute. They do. It, author's publication fee. Um, open access journals is a new thing. Uh, in 2000, if you said, I'm going to go publish an open access journal, everybody around you said, don't do that. If you publish open access, that means that it's a bad journal. It wasn't that long ago that open access meant low quality. It's not true anymore. APP, AMPPS charges. Plus one, Frontier, Sage Open, Cogent OA. I just saw this. I added Journal of Pacific Rim Psychology has announced that they no longer are concerned only about the Pacific Rim. 
They're open access for free. So everybody else up there, except for one, everybody else up there, except for one has like $2,000 open access fee, not general Pacific rim psychology. Or Martha, Psychi Journal. Who's a Psychi member? Do you know the number one most valuable benefit you get as a Psychi member? Open access publishing. If you're a member, you can submit, faculty, grad students, undergrads, if you're a member, you could submit to the Psychi Journal. If you publish in Psychi Journal, it's open access, no charge. That's a reason to join, by the way, the $55 year long fee, or if you're faculty, no charge, right? It's no charge for faculty. Yeah. Faculty advisors. Oh, 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 yeah. $55 for lifetime open access publishing. And then, uh, the final one, this just got, this just came out, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Rulage open research, no editor, rapid publication. So you submit the manuscript and, and then it, it's published and then it goes out for review. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So. The other side of it's crowd projects, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, I think Jordan Waggy's not here, but, oh, she is here. If you turn around, Jordan Waggy will talk to you about the CREPE, Collaborative Applications Education Project, undergraduates doing authentic research into research methods class. Or the EMI 1-2, EMI 3 is going on right now. We won 99 samples from across the world looking at emerging adulthood measuring multiple institutions. Uh, we're looking for contributors. Or the Psychi Network for International Collaborative Change. You want to ex get your students in crowdsourcing. There, there's three that are active. Professionals are normally spending time on the right side. The RPP's over. Many labs are all over. But uh, Psych Science Accelerator. If you're not a member of the Psych Science Accelerator and you value doing research, I think you're missing. Uh, it. There's lots of roles that you can be involved in in Psych Science Accelerator, but they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of researchers on all six continents that have humans on it. It is the biggest crowd. They've developed the best management uh, tools. They're explicitly designed to be diverse, socially just, sustainable, and they want, they're open to criticism. I love people that are open to criticism, except for me. I won't even touch this slide except to say that they're not all the same. These crowd projects all differ, and these are the criteria upon which they do differ. So I'm asking us to move to, into the future. I'm saying that now is the time to advance diversity, social justice, and sustainability. But we have to navigate this challenge of the conflict between pastoral and enlightened approaches and it's across all technological or social constructs. How can we agree on any decision if we differ on what we believe utopia should be? I argue that the way to do it is through a diverse, socially just, and sustainable lens. And I'm going to get into a little bit more of this uh, later. Uh, and I'll note that PLU, Pacific Lutheran University, in 2012, wrote a long-range plan and they were, what, what's our core value? And some people, well, it's diversity. And other people said, no, no, it's social justice. Without social justice, diversity didn't mean anything. And others said, well, you got to have a planet. Sustainability. It's all about, and we argued and argued and argued. And, and at some point, we started recognizing that it's the, it's the conflict amongst the three. It's the discussions about the three that really need to be uplifted not one that's not one it's all so i'll ask you where does djs fit into your utopia i'm assuming that i don't have any neo-nazis that are thinking that you know <laughs> D djs that's hogwash uh if you want to, if you want more on my opinions about this here are two papers uh both are, are open access and available to you uh, the one on the on the left here is about how open science advances DJS in the classroom. And on the right, uh, it's, it's trying to explain DJS in a complex sense rather than just, I like diversity, I like sustainability, I like uh, sustain, uh, social justice. So I just show our hands, who's, a vote, who's opposed to diversity? I had hands every other question. Right now, nobody's willing to admit. Who's opposed to social justice? Sustainable future. 
I'm not surprised. In fact, I'd be quite surprised. Some of somebody out there might be like me raising their hand just for fun, but I'd be surprised if anyone was sitting at WPA saying social justice, what are you kidding me? The problem is, and I'm sure you understand this. We don't actually value all diversity. I, in fact, just demonstrated some diversity I don't value. I don't want to hang out with neo-Nazis and discuss whether or not their plan's the right one. I've got no value for that at all. First degree child abuse. No, I don't, I don't value it. So there are things that we don't value and, and that's okay. I don't think anybody's running around. Well, the neo-Nazis are. We don't always agree on social justice and equity decisions. I don't remember. There was a speaker even earlier today that was talking about problems with, with equity in, in the workspace that it's perceived on one side as just being negative. It is the case. I hope I don't get tomatoes thrown at me. It is the case that equity decisions require that somebody gets something and somebody else doesn't get it. So we are going to start valuing certain outcomes. So the fact that there's too many white faculty, white male faculty, we need to open up those pipelines to make the diverse. That's a social justice problem. But there are spaces along the way that will, the, the white boys will say, well, what happened to me? You don't value me anymore. But most of us say, yeah, I get that complaint that you think is a complaint, but it doesn't, it's not valued here, right? Most of us. And then uh, past the sustainable futures are estimates, not facts. Um, I'm, I'm sad at some things that we do. I think that we've got more capacity in our anthropogenic age to fix some of the problems. I don't want to stop flying on an airplane to fix the climate. I'm not going to stop eating meat to fix the climate. And I know I'm annoying some of you at this. I get that. But I disagree with you. And I feel fully and completely justified to disagree with you. So we got to move forward on that disagreement. And, uh, you know, unless you just never want to speak to me again, which I'll cry a little bit. Or I want to, I, I want to try to work through this disagreement a little bit. And, and this is the visitor. This is a picture from the visitor center looking at the Little Rock, Arkansas High School, uh, which if you haven't been to Little Rock, Arkansas High School National Park, I suggest going. Um, we all get taught in school that desegregation, right? The, the national guard, the army walked the nine students into class and then it was desegregated. Isn't that what we're taught in school? Do you know what happened after that? Do you know that the national guard, the army was replaced by the national guard? Do you know that the governor forced the national guard to only stay outside the school? Do you know the abuse, the abuse that those nine, the Little Rock nine received from other students, from their faculty, from their teachers, from the administration? One young woman was attacked in the lunchroom. She retaliated and was expelled. She was attacked, retaliated and expelled. Do you know at the end of that year, the governor shut the school down in order to avoid desegregation, the school was shut down. How many of you knew that there was another whole year? There's another year of desegregation. How many of you knew that? How many of you didn't? Yeah, th this is something worth visit. So um, I'm going to try to convey my ideas of the challenges of the diversity through what I call on the last slide, a meal to four rather than a metaphor. So you might be familiar with this notion that uh, America as a melting pot, right? We take all the immigrants, we bring them here, and we retrain them to be Americans. The problem is, is that American identity was the waspy, white male, singular ideal, right? That we're going to strip away all of your culture and make you American. I've got sites down here uh, for, for people saying, wait, there's a problem with that. In response, there was an argument starting in the 60s that we should have a salad metaphor. So if, if the identity of the United States is made up of everybody's individual culture, you retain your culture and you have a salad 
rather than a melting pot. I always like the stew pot metaphor instead of the salad. And the problem I have with the salad is that I still only taste the tomato if I only put the tomato in my mouth. I like the stew pot because when I put the tomato in my mouth in the stew pot, I still taste the tomato primarily, but I also taste the stew. And it seems to be, to, to me, again, this is just me. It seems to me an ideal way to think about identity. Now, which one's right? It doesn't matter. It does, you, can, you, can, you can disagree with me and I'll let you disagree with me and I won't even argue it. The point is, is that we have at least three vastly different ways of thinking about the way identity should be forced. And that's diversity. Uh, Leslie et al., not Leslie Alvarez, the last name Leslie. Leslie et al. looked at different types of identity conceptions and how that was related to prejudice, discrimination, stereotyping, and pol policy support. And so on the left, the identity blind, those are melting pot identities. Here's another thing to note. There's three melting pot identities. There's not just one. And then the salad identity on the right side. And now you've got all those hypotheses. You see that uh, there's more prejudice with melting pot, but there's some, there's colorblindness is negatively related to stereotyping. Probably didn't expect to see that one. So let's, let's take that forward to social justice then. We don't, we don't end at diversity. So who gets to decide what the correct identity is? Who's the cook? Whose identity is considered a good meal? Like I said, the melting pot wanted the waspy white guy identity as the ideal. Well, who gets to decide what the ideal is? Certainly not the waspy white guy, but who? That's social justice. And how much does it eat? How much does it cost to eat or to become a cook? How hard is it for me to keep my identity? How hard is it for me to be a decider on what the ideal identity is? That's equity. Let's take it one more step into sustainability. Are all the ingredients sourced well? Does that cultural identity encourage thriving? There were talks this weekend. Cultural identity isn't helping because that cultural identity has been stripped down or uh, eliminated. Is the ideal being prepared using resources responsibly? Is, is the identity, is the depth, the resources of that identity prevalent and we're able to, I got the word up there, cultural genocide. Is the identity still there? And then how long is this identity that you've got going to last? Diversity, social justice, sustainability. Of course, we got to put this into a two by two by two. And then I'm just going to take that top line and show you like how that looks differently. So the far left is yes, yes, yes. We're doing all three. So all meals are made. All identities are valued. Anyone can be uh, a, a cook or a, a consumer. Meals are healthy. Everybody's using everything wise. And then as we move to the right, we start losing pieces of that. But the problem is, as you know, it's not a two by two by two. It's a regression line. And it's all continuous. And there's interaction terms. There's that three-way interaction. We got to put all those other six effects in there first to find out. And that Y represents every behavior, decision, policy, regarding all people's places and environmental systems. That is one complex formula. Let me just sit there just one more. To me, to me, this is the challenge of diversity, justice, and sustainability. This is the conversation that we need to have if we're working together on that next step. Okay. I believe, and I've given this talk many times, the open science movement does a lot for diversity, social justice, and sustainability. One thing is open science is open, meaning all, all voices now can get in there. Now, so uh, we, we actually had a uh, Siegel here earlier. She's probably not here today or in the talk, but here's three papers that actually make the argument that uh, 
open science values different aspects of diversity even. Additionally, those tools that I talked about earlier reduce barriers and offer new rewards. That's all about social justice. Finally, reproducibility, cr pro uh, uh, reproducibility problem was a sustainability problem. It was a threat to the length that we could believe in effects. How long is this effect true? Now, I argue, by the way, that we're humans, and so no effect is going to last that long, right? We change, therefore we need to be changeable as a field, but it should last longer than I published it, now the effect's gone. Okay, and I know I've, I, I've only got a couple slides left. So the time is now. Why is the time now? Well, you're living in the same world I am. My students don't always seem to be living in the same world I am, but you're with me, right? What did you think about this week? Oh, I was worried about what job I was going to get this summer. Well, what about Putin and the bomb? What, did you think about that? Oh, yeah, I don't know. So we're at that moment in time. And for me, this will shock some of my students, but for me, he loves the word, right? The way to actually resolve the problem is to walk in and say, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach you with love, not inappropriately. I'm going to approach you with love. All right, so predictions, the hopeful future predictions that we achieve several kinds of utopia. Several kinds of utopia, not just one, because that wouldn't value diversity, would it? Demise, the world's inherited by cockroaches, rats, and crows, and, and, and jellyfish in the water. Well, what if we use the past of the future, World War III, followed by a dark age, followed by a new age of enlightenment some period later? Um, I'm not going to spend much time here because I'm already a minute and a half longer than I wanted to be. Uh, but where do we want to go? Uh, who's on council? Council reps, you still here? I talked to you about, you know, we need your voices about where MPA is going to go. The board needs to hear what we need to do. I told you this as well. I think MPA, I think WPA should be a 12-month association, not five days. I think that we have a lot to offer each other in July, October, January, not just the last weekend of April. All right. So our choices are our own. Are they predictable? I don't know. Do you believe in free will? I don't know. This discussion I'm going to have with my personality students in two days. We are a multitude of diverse and imperfect beings. Can't psychology work as, help us work better together? I think so. When I go to the talks, I have hope. When I want all your talks, I get hope. And time is brief. Uh, it, it, those of you who are 25 or less, when I was 25 or less, 50 seemed like so far away. Um, now, 25 seems like it was yesterday. So the time is now because you only get 90, 95, 102, 72, and you're already a quarter way through. And I'll end with, I'll end with, this is my first conference, 1992, SEPA. I presented uh, how to how to value systems differ depending on what church you go to. I have no idea who the young woman is to the far right. I remember her and I'd studied a lot together, but I cannot remember her name or whatever happened to her. Thinking we didn't have Facebook. And then on the right, that's uh, thank you. That's a picture taken by you. Uh, I was on the WPA program. Uh, here we are. It was the 2016 conference. Uh, there I was standing with all my students. And they said, well, that, that's a picture that we should use on next year's poster. And well, I love attention. That's not how it works. Thank you. Mm -hmm.